Welcome to One Healthy World. I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And I'm Dr. Gemma Newman, also known as the Plant Power Doctor. And we are here with the second half of season three. We've talked a lot about weight loss, but now we're going to shift our attention to diabetes with a three-part series on controlling blood sugar, Dr. Newman. Yeah, this should be really interesting. And it's such an important topic for the U.S. especially. I know that there are so many people living here in the U.S. that have diabetes. The numbers are staggering. Oh, they really are. 40 million people in the U.S. are now living with diabetes. And incredibly, nearly one in five people will have diabetes between the ages of 45 and 64. And then at 65, almost 30 percent of U.S. adults are living with diabetes. So the risk goes up as we get older. That doesn't seem like a whole lot of fun. But I'll tell you what, what I do know for a fact also, not a problem just exclusive to the U.S. No, the International Diabetes Federation predicts that by 2045, one in eight people around the world will be living with diabetes and they won't even know it. One in eight? That's like almost 800 million people. That's a lot of people, Dr. Newman. That is an incredible number. But in doing so much work here at the Physicians Committee and through countless episodes of the exam room. One of the things that excites me the most is that despite the fact that so many people have diabetes, we also know that when it comes to chronic conditions, this is one of the most preventable and in some cases even reversible diseases. This is why it's so important to talk about, Chuck, because in my practice, I've seen many of my patients reverse their type 2 diabetes through diet alone. It's amazing to see. I love to hear that. So let's get into the science. Let's kick everything off with our friend, Dr. Neil Barnard. Yeah, Dr. Barnard's going to share some amazing science about why insulin resistance occurs. Check it out. Researchers have made important discoveries about the cause of type 2 diabetes, discoveries that show us how to reverse the disease process, at least in theory. It starts with glucose, a simple sugar that the body uses for fuel. To get glucose into your cells, your body uses insulin, which is made in the pancreas, goes through the blood, and attaches to each cell like, like a key and a lock and that opens up the cell membrane to let glucose enter. Researchers at Yale recruited volunteers. They placed an IV tube into each participant's vein, and they infused the lipid into their veins, and the researchers found that that lipid infusion caused the cells to stop responding normally to insulin. That's insulin resistance. As the fat builds up inside the cell, the insulin key doesn't work anymore. Now, at the time, many people imagined that diabetes is caused by sugar. Well, this study showed that the real culprit is fatty foods. They cause the fat to accumulate in the cells of the body. And when that happens, you get insulin resistance that can lead to diabetes. Now, we don't take fat from an IV. We take it in meals. So the researchers then looked at the effect of fatty meals. And they found that they could cause insulin resistance in a matter of hours. The first study used palm oil. Within just hours of eating a meal loaded with palm oil, the participants became insulin resistant. And the same thing happened with canola oil. It doesn't take months, it doesn't take years to develop insulin resistance. Food can cause it within hours. These studies suggest that the answer to type 2 diabetes is to get the fat out of your cells. And to do that, we need to get the fat off our plate. So that means avoiding animal products keeping oils to a minimum, too. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. And the concept kind of seems simple enough. It just seems like if there's less fat to clog up the cells, it gives your body an opportunity to regulate its blood sugar and work properly. Yeah, absolutely. So we think about glucose as being a precious fuel for our bodies, but it needs to be in our cells, not in our bloodstream. Because when the glucose is in our bloodstream, that's when it can cause problems. And that's why we need insulin, because insulin is our amazing transporter hormone. It doesn't just transport glucose, but of course we know it for that reason, because of diabetes. So when insulin is available to transport that glucose from the bloodstream into the cells using little uh, lock and key mechanism on the cell membrane, that's when the glucose goes where it's needed. So with type 1 diabetes, you just don't have enough insulin. And that's, that's why the glucose stays in the bloodstream. With type 2 diabetes, you may have enough insulin, but the lock and key mechanism is jammed. So it doesn't matter how much insulin you've got, that glucose is not getting into the cell where it's needed because the saturated fat is jamming up that lock. 
Interesting. You see, I love it when you doctors, you're able to just paint in simple science for us so we can understand that. Like, there's nothing simple about diabetes, and yet you've explained it using two things, a lock and a key, something that we can all understand. Well done, Dr. Newman. Thanks, Chuck. I love it. <laughs> no, that's so cool. Uh, let's shift our attention now to uh, carbs, though, because Carbs are something that people who are living with diabetes seem, by and large, just like a lot of people who are trying to lose weight that we talked about earlier in the season, they just fear them to death, Dr. Newman. Yeah, and it's such a shame because actually carbohydrates do not drive diabetes. It's the saturated fat in our food that does that. And so people get so confused, they're told not to eat bananas, not to eat rice, they're worried that it's gonna cause a big sugar spike. And they do sometimes see a sugar spike before they have eliminated that saturated fat from their diet. Once they've been able to reduce the amount of saturated fat, they're able to process that carbohydrate nice and easily. I love that. And I think that we can look a little bit more into what the standard diabetes diet might look like and, and why people are told not to eat carbohydrates initially. Um, but based off of what it is we've been kind of learning here, um, fat is the real concern. And then I also want to ask you about the glycemic index, because that's another thing that is, is the gospel for people who have diabetes. So for those of us who aren't familiar, what exactly is the glycemic index? Yeah, so the glycemic index is a way of measuring how quickly the carbohydrates we eat go from our bloodstream into our cells. And it's a measure out of 100. So if your glycemic index um, is 100 for a certain food, then it, it goes into the bloodstream very quickly from when you've eaten it. Whereas if it's a low glycemic index food, so maybe around 10, 20, 30, 40, then it takes longer to get from your stomach into the bloodstream. Fiber, I'm guessing, is gonna play a role in this? Absolutely. When you eat more fiber, then it means that the glycemic index of the food that you're consuming is gonna be lower. Mm, even a, a food like the, the nice fruit that we have in front of us. Well, this is where something else can be quite handy, actually. When we think about foods in terms of the glycemic load, because when a food is high in sugar and fiber and water, it could have a high glycemic index, like watermelon, for example, because it's got high amount of sugar in it, but the glycemic load is very low because of the fiber content. Interesting, interesting. And, and would that go by and large for all fruits and vegetables, foods that have that fiber packed into them? the difference between, say, oranges and an orange juice, say? Absolutely, and again, it's about the water content as well. So the more fiber and water that a food contains, then the lower the glycemic load when you consume it. All right, I want to get real nerdy with you and really break this down. I wanna ask you about the various types of starches and how they may play a role here as well. I'm glad you asked me that, Chuck, because the polysaccharides in starch differ in how our bodies absorb them. So you've got amylose and amylopectin, and you've got both of those things in rice, for example, but the amylose is quite different in structure. Although it's soluble in water, it also has a helical structure, so it goes around in a coil, which means it's harder to digest compared to amylopectin, which is straight in its structure, which makes it more easy to digest. And you can tell sometimes which starch is in the food by its texture. So for example, with rice, if you've got a sticky rice, then that's got more amylopectin in it, uh, which means that it's got a higher a glycemic index, compared to rice when it's cooked that has individual grains, that would contain more amylose, which means that your glycemic index is lower. Fascinating. But let's talk about something that often maybe gets overlooked here, and I really didn't even think about it until I sat down and I started jotting down all the things that I wanted to ask you about, and that was acidity here in food and how that might play a role too. Yeah, it's really interesting because certain foods with higher acidity, like vinegar, for example, can actually slow your gastric emptying, which means that your stomach takes longer to digest the food, and it can increase the efficiency that you absorb the sugar, which means that it's gonna be in the bloodstream for less time. So it can be really helpful to consume acidic foods along with your carbohydrates. Fair question to ask, how dependable, how reliable is a glycemic index versus glycemic load? Should we be looking more toward one or the other or do they work together? Well, they kind of work together, but I think for the purposes of something like this, I really want to encourage people to keep it super simple. If you think about foods that are whole and plant, you're going to get all that you need and it's going to generally be slower release. So whole grains, whole grain rice, whole grain bread, um, your legumes, your fruits, your vegetables, these are all great foods for both satiety and making sure that your diabetes is under better control. 
If you're getting into the numbers, then ideally you want to have something that is lower in glycemic index and load. Uh, but I don't want people to get too caught up on the specifics because then it can cause anxiety around food. What about oatmeal? Would that fall into the good category here? Yes, it would. Now, oatmeal is considered to be a low GI food on the scale around 55, which means that it's going to be a good, slow digestion food for your breakfast. I am glad to hear you say that because our culinary whiz and Christine has been busy in the kitchen whipping up oats not one, not two, but three ways. Oats. They're not just for breakfast anymore. They're a lifestyle. Hey friends, it's Anne from Veggie Mini Feek, your go-to for holistic health and a healthy vegan lifestyle. Oats, the little grain that could. They're humble, hearty, and today they're having their moment. We're doing oats three ways. An energy bar with rolled oats, a cozy bowl of oatmeal with steel cut oats, and brace yourselves, risotto made with whole oat groats. Risotto. Okay, so first up, energy bars with rolled oats. These are perfect for when you need a snack on the go or you've got hungry kiddos. Full of fiber, naturally sweetened, and they'll keep you full whether you're running errands or a marathon. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do. In a food processor, you're going to put a heaping cup of packed pitted dates, a fourth cup maple syrup or agave nectar, a fourth cup creamy salted natural peanut butter or almond butter or the nut butter of your choice, a cup of roasted nuts, one and a half cup rolled oats, and then of course additional add-ins, chocolate chips, dried fruit, vanilla, etc. So you blend all that fun stuff in a food processor, then you're going to press firmly, super firmly into a pan and pop it in the fridge for an hour. No oven, no stress. Just slice them up and start chewing. Next, we've got oatmeal with steel-cut oats. Think of these as the fancy cousin of rolled oats. They're chewier, heartier, and perfect for a cozy breakfast. Cook them in a creamy plant milk with a little bit of cinnamon, and then top with your favorite fruits, nuts, and maybe a drizzle of maple syrup. So fugue. Plus, get this, steel-cut oats digest more slowly, keeping you fuller and more satisfied for longer. And now, the pièce de résistance oat groat risotto. Whole oat groats are nutty and chewy, making them the perfect swap for rice in risotto. First, you're going to saute some onions and garlic, and then add in your oat groats and toast them a little bit. Then just like risotto, you're going to add veggie broth one ladle at a time until it's starting to get creamy and dreamy. Throw in some nutritional yeast for that cheesy vibe. Maybe some mushrooms, spinach, or whatever veggies you've got on hand. And finish with a little squeeze of lemon. So there you have it, oats three ways. Energy bars for busy bees, oatmeal for cozy mornings, and oat groat risotto for when you want to impress either yourself or someone else. Ta oats for the win, and Christine does it again. The recipe is on our website, and I gotta tell you, that is such an easy way to replace a lot of those unhealthy junk food carbs that can really get in there and muck up the blood sugar for a lot of people living with diabetes. Yeah, it really is. And I'd also say it's great to add in those extra seeds and nuts as well to keep you full for longer, which really adds to the benefits of the oats and the recipes. Yeah, you know, so thinking about this, like when we think about grab and go foods, easy junk foods that we reach for in the standard Western diet, I don't like that term, it's like a clinical thing, but whatever, the diet that the majority of us eat, you know, all of those grab and go prepackaged foods. So like, what are some healthier options that you might suggest for someone who's really looking to control their blood sugar? I'm glad you asked me that because I, I love the idea of a trail mix. What's great about that is that you can add in whatever you like the most um, and you've got loads of options for healthy nuts, healthy seeds, and of course some dried fruits in there as well. Um, and things like hummus, um, I love different kind of things like tahini, you can mix them up with uh, crudités, that's a really lovely snack, with carrots and celery, uh, and it tastes great too. I'm a huge fan of trail mix. There's something about that nut and then that sweet combo, whether it's a date or a raisin, once it just gets in your mouth, it's just like, oh, 
So good. Yeah, tastes so great. So good. That is a heck of a combo. I'll tell you what, though. There was somebody close to me who shall remain nameless, had diabetes for many, many, many years before they passed. And Dr. Newman, I was actually both like amazed in a good and a bad way at the way she was able to game the system. I mean, it was nothing for her to eat donuts for breakfast, go to the mall, eat a pretzel, have ice cream later on. And, and somehow she managed to game the system and keep her blood sugar under control. Mind you, this was like completely, you know, non-diabetes friendly food she was eating. Gaming the system, a good idea or not? Well, I think it's so important to know, especially for type 1 uh, diabetes, that often people are told it doesn't really matter what you eat as long as you measure um, your glycemic index and as long as you give yourself the right dose of insulin, you'll be fine. But actually, more and more people are discovering that when they do this, they end up having to take more insulin, which has an impact on their long-term mortality risk, which means they have a higher risk of dying early because they've taken a lot of insulin in their lifetime. So what's far better is to improve your insulin sensitivity Sensitivity. So if you have foods that give you more insulin sensitivity, you're going to need less insulin shots. And if you're type 2 diabetes, you may not even need your insulin shots at all. I love where your head's at, and I love that that's where we're headed to in our next episode, How to Reverse Diabetes. I am really excited about that. That's going to give hope to millions of people. Me too, and I've seen it work for my patients and for people in the Physicians Committee as well. It's amazing work that we're going to do. Absolutely. So that is the next episode here on One Healthy World, but be sure to like this episode and subscribe to the channel in the meantime. But we will talk to you again very soon, and until then, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And I'm Dr. Gemma Newman, also known as the plant power doctor.